the name of Jesus our Savior who came to serve us rather than to be served by us who came to, came to give his life as the sacrifice for us that we might be his people to live with him forever and to live for him now as you and I live in humble service to those around us the word of God for our devotion to which I direct your devout attention this morning is the gospel reading appointed for today from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Then they, that is Jesus and his disciples, left that place and made their way through Galilee. But he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child, had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. This is the word of our Lord. The name of Jesus, our suffering, our humble servant, my fellow servants in Christ. I was reading the other day a story to the preschool kids. The story is called The Biggest Leaf Pile. The story is about four leaves who are friends. There's, um, let me open it up. There, there, there's red oak and purple beech and yellow hickory and orange maple. And as they're hanging on the trees, they are talking to each other, and the topic of their conversation is that they are eager for the autumn wind to come along, blow them off their trees so that they can be together as friends in the big leaf pile down below. And they said things like this, I'm so excited, said Red Oak, the wind will be here soon. And she's going to blow us into the air, said Purple Beach. Then we'll tumble to the ground, said Orange Maple, and we'll all be together, added Yellow Hickory. That will be great. And sure enough, the wind came along in a little bit, and with a big whoosh, it blew all the leaves off the tree, and they went spinning and twirling and tumbling through, and they were so happy. They were so glad to be together, and, and they said, we're all together now, and they, they were excited to be together. Well, then a blue jay came flying overhead. And the blue jay said, hello down there. I've been flying all over the countryside, the blue jay said, and your leaf pile is the biggest one I've seen. Really, asked Yellow Hickory? Yes, it's probably the biggest leaf pile in the whole world. Well, the leaves got really excited about that, to hear that this was the biggest leaf pile in the whole world. And one of them said, wow! And another one said, that's wonderful! And then shortly after that, they got into an argument with each other. And you can guess what the argument was about. Anybody want to take a guess what the argument was about? Which leaf, since this was the biggest leaf pile in the whole world, which leaf was the one that should be on the top? I should be on top. Yellow Hickory said, and her reason was because I'm the color of the sun, and the sun helps trees and flowers grow. 
Of course, Red Oak didn't like that. He said, no, I should be on top because I'm the color of delicious apples and juicy strawberries. And then Purple Beach interrupted and said, no, it should be me because I'm the color of yummy plums and beautiful violets. And then, of course, to that, Orange Maple shouted, no, 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 me, 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 because I'm the color of Halloween pumpkins and crunchy carrots. The, uh, the whole argument came to a grinding halt when a big bear came and jumped into the pile. And no, I know what some of you boys are thinking. Oh good, the bear came and squished them all. No, he didn't. But the bear jumped in, scattered the whole leaf pile, it blew all over the place, and now, now it wasn't the biggest leaf pile in the whole world anymore, so there was nothing to brag about and nothing to say, I'm better than you. You know, it's a cute story, but as I read it, I thought, you know, this really isn't all that cute. It's a story that it's all too real, and it happens all too often. And it isn't about the leaves. It, it, it's about us, because we're always bickering and arguing over who's the best, who's the greatest, right? We have that argument all the time. It's the same argument that Jesus' disciples got into in our gospel reading here this morning. It's a pretty common argument that we all have. And because this is the exact opposite way that God wants us as his people to think and to act, Jesus uses this occasion as a teachable moment to teach Jesus' disciples and to teach you and me what real greatness is all about. Now, Jesus had just pulled his disciples aside privately because he had something important that he wanted to teach them. This is what Mark says. Then they left that place and made their way through Galilee, but he didn't want anybody to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise after three days. This isn't the first time that Jesus told them this. He had told them this same thing a little earlier, and man, it went over their heads. They didn't get it. They were clueless. But Jesus wanted them to know. He wanted them to understand it was important for them to know this was important for them to know this because Jesus didn't want them totally shocked when they saw it happen. It was going to happen in about a month. At the same time, in, in, in a little more than a month from then, they were the ones who were going to have to go out into the world and tell other people that Jesus is the Son of God, the long-promised Savior who had come to win the forgiveness of sins for everybody, and the way he was going to do it was through his death and through his resurrection. The, the disciples' reaction to this whole thing is just... It, it's astounding. It's hard to believe. It's just, it's just incredible. On one hand, they stood there in stunned silence. They just stood there with their mouths open. But the next thing they do is they get into this bickering argument over which one of them is the greatest. I mean, think about this. Jesus just gets done telling them that he is going to be betrayed, that he is going to be brutally treated, he is going to be executed, he's going to be murdered in a horrible way, he's going to be put to death on the cross, and all they can do is think about their own self-importance in this kingdom that Jesus has been talking about. All they can do is argue about who's the best. You think about that. I mean, that, that would be like if you went to the doctor and, and while you're at the doctor, the doctor tells you the, the, the terrible news that you've got some kind of an incurable disease. 
And he tells you how this disease is going to progress and how it's going to rob you of your life in a few months and, and how painful it's going to be, this whole process is going to be. So you go home and you get your family together and you break the news to them and you tell them everything about this disease you got and how much suffering and hurt you're going to go through and that you're going to die. And you just get done saying that to your kids. And then all of a sudden the reaction you get is one of the kids says, you know, mom always wanted me to have the heirloom jewelry, so I'm the one who ought to get it. And the next, the next sibling pops in and says, ah, no, 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 no. No, you, you, you got that all wrong. I was always mom and dad's favorite. So I'm the one that should get the house. And the rest of you ought to be lucky if you get a few bucks. And your third sibling jumps in and says, you two got it all wrong here. I'm the one that took care of mom and dad when they were old and sick. You two barely showed up to visit. You didn't help at all. Don't expect to get anything. I'm getting it all. Wouldn't you label that kind of behavior as rude and insensitive? Especially right in front of you? That's exactly what the disciples did. And the bad thing about this is, is this wasn't the first time they had the argument and got corrected on it. And it's not the last time they're going to have the They're going to have this argument again in a month as they're sitting in the upper room with Jesus on the night he's betrayed and he's telling them, I'm going to be, I'm going to be betrayed tonight. They're capturing me tonight. I'm going to the cross. And they argue about who's the greatest. This argument about who's the best, who's the greatest, was an issue that the disciples struggled with. And it's an issue that you and I struggle with too. Okay? And, and, and we struggle with this issue because we struggle with this issue of pride, this sin of pride, this sin that says, I am so good, I deserve everything, it's, it's my wants and my needs come first and that, that, that attitude comes so naturally. I mean, when you think about it, wasn't it pride that fueled Adam and Eve to sin in the first place? Wasn't it their own pride that said, you know, we know better than God what our needs are and what's going to give us a fulfilling life. We know this a whole lot better than he does. Isn't, isn't that what got him in the first place? Jesus calls us to humble service, but honestly, in most of our cases, that is not on our agenda. It is not on our agenda to be on the serving end of things. We like being on the serve me type of stuff. You know, you know how it goes. Okay, so I'm sitting in the recliner the other night true story. And this does not make me look good at all. I'm going to confess. Remember how we began the service by saying that I stood up and I confessed my sins to you? Here we go. I was tired. I was worn out. All I wanted to do was plop down in the recliner and read. All I wanted to do, I wanted some quiet time. My wife decides she wants to talk. She didn't see it. I rolled my eyes. So I talked. Right? I'm supposed to be the servant here, and I'm not happy about this. But I talked. My wife wanted to talk. Guys, does this sound familiar? Guys, does this sound familiar to you? Yeah. Finally, she winds down a little bit. I'm sorry, this doesn't sound good, but... And I finally say, good, I finally get to read my book. And she says, will you come here and help me with something? 
Ugh. Do you know what I thought? Why doesn't she just do it herself? I have been working all day. She's just been at home. Guys, have you done that one yet? Huh? Yeah. Ladies, you've had the long day. You're tired, you're worn out, you finally get to bed. And one of the kids calls out, Mommy, I don't feel so good, and then proceeds to prove it to you. And you're thinking, why doesn't, why doesn't Dad get up and take care of this? But he doesn't, so you drag yourself out of bed. Yeah, you ladies, you moms know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? You drag yourself out of bed, you take care of the child, you get everything all cleaned up, you get everything settled, you mumble and groan, but you help because it's what you're supposed to do. But you're thinking, uh, I don't like this. I'm doing it because I have to. I think he ought to be doing it. Right? Maybe the pride pokes out a different way, doesn't it? Maybe it pokes out because you're looking down on other people because of the way they talk, the way they dress, the lifestyle they have, and you figure, I'm a whole lot better than that. And God owes me for being better than that. In the end of everything, I ought to get better than they do because I don't talk that way, I don't dress that way, I don't live that way. And so Jesus has got to pull you and me aside just like he pulled his disciples aside. And he teaches us that real greatness comes from humble service. He summed it up with one simple little sentence. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And Jesus demonstrated this principle in his own life. Even when Jesus wanted his quiet time, his alone time, if the people had needs, he cheerfully and gladly met them because he had come to serve them, not to be served by them. So he healed their diseases. He helped their, their, their lame and their blind. He raised their dead. He did all that because he had come to serve. And it especially showed in his humble service to us. Remember what Jesus said at the very beginning of the reading? The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise three days later. That's humble service. To lay down his life for us in suffering and death to pay for our sins so that we wouldn't have to die for them. He went to the cross and there he willingly suffered God's judgment of hell and torture for our sins. He did it so that you and I could be declared forgiven before God. He did it to pull us out of the grip of our selfishness. He did it not just so that one day you and I could go to heaven, but Jesus did it so that you and I could step out into our world and see our place in our world as men and women who have been called into the world as servants to others. And then Jesus shows us in a practical way what humble service is all about as he puts a little child in front of his disciples and says to us, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but him who sent me. And that's, that's greatness, isn't it? It's welcoming and serving a little child. It's wiping the runny noses and changing the diapers and, and, and feeding them. It's listening to them whine when they're not getting their way and still loving them. Greatness is when you and I serve each other in that same humble, gentle spirit. It's seeing people's needs and responding to them in love, in humility, in service, without 
It's, it's, it's doing the servant thing without expecting some kind of fanfare or thanks or pat on the back. Maybe the best way to close the sermon is with the words of the Apostle Paul from Philippians 2 ringing in our ears. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind set as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's service. May you and I live such a life praising God, praising him in the highest way, giving him and others our service. Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise.